Madison and I lived in Dallas for a few years right after we got married when I was in seminary at SMU, at Perkins School of Theology. And we lived in an apartment, but we both grew up with dogs, and so we really wanted to get a dog. And that first year of marriage, we told ourselves everything that couples tell themselves when they live in an apartment and want a dog, right? That we're going to wait, that we're not going to get one until we have a yard, that we really shouldn't get a dog until we actually have a house. And we like both grew up with bigger dogs. And so we didn't really want to get like a little itty bitty dog that would be better for an apartment. If we were going to do it, we wanted to do it right. And we, we promised ourselves that we were not going to get a dog until we moved back to Alabama and got in a house and actually had a yard to raise a puppy in. And then on our one-year anniversary, we ended up driving to Buffalo, Texas to pick up an eight-week-old golden retriever puppy who we still have. His name is Doc. And Doc, even with him being, I am convinced, like the best dog ever, I don't think there is a better dog out there than my guy Doc, taught us a lot about patience. Or maybe I should say he taught me a lot about patience, especially from, from day one. I remember the first night that we had him, the day that we had brought him home. He had been this cute, adorable puppy all day long. I mean, he had been perfect. He had gone outside to use the bathroom as an eight-week-old puppy. I mean, he did everything right, and I was convinced, like, we got the perfect dog. I don't know how this happened, but he is literally perfect. And then bedtime came around. And we had done our research, so we let him fall asleep, I think fall asleep in one of our laps when we were watching TV, and then we made that transition where we got up and tried to keep him asleep, and we had a crate set up in our bedroom with a sheet draped over the top of it, and like the biggest, fluffiest, most comfortable blanket that we could muster up all folded up inside of the crate, and I remember just like laying him down as gently as I could inside of the crate, and slowly closing the door, And as soon as the door latched, he was like wide awake. And I remember thinking, how in the world can a noise like that come out of a puppy that small? Have y'all ever been there before? Like the yipping and the barking and the whining, and it's like the perfect pitch to immediately give you a headache, like out out of nowhere. And we didn't want to get kicked out of our apartment, so we probably opened up the crate way sooner than we should have and got him out, and he immediately ran to the wall where there were some pillows leaned up against the wall and hid behind the pillows which was super cute, right? But also infuriating because it's basically the same thing as a crate, right? And so I turned to Madison, and I don't remember what I said, but it was dramatic. I know it was dramatic, and it was completely unreasonable. And she looked at me like with disgust, I think realizing she was looking at the father of her future children and like my, my lack of ability to stay with something for five seconds. And she was like, Ross, he's a puppy. You have to be patient. You have to be patient. And so it took like two hours to get him back in the crate. We made trails of treats that led him into the crate doors. And we finally lured him to walk back in under his own accord. And then we both slept on the floor in front of the crate with our fingers sticking through like touching his paws. And that was just the first night. (laughs) I mean, Doc really did. He taught me a lot about about patience. And patience, I'm guessing, is something that we could all be just a little bit better at. Something that we could all probably have a little bit more of in our lives. And I bet it's something that we're usually really thankful for when other people are willing to show it to us. And it's also something that we find all over Scripture. Love is patient. Love is kind. You've heard that one before, haven't you? Patience is better than pride. We find that in Ecclesiastes. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. That's in Romans. I mean, patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we find laid out for us in in Galatians. So I don't think it should be a surprise to us that in one of the most practical books in Scripture, the book that we've been in for the last couple of weeks in James, patience is how he ends his letter. James simply challenges us, I think, to be a more patient people. Let's read our Scripture together this morning. We're in James chapter 5, which is the last chapter of the book, and we're in verses 7 through 11. 
Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who show endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. The more that I thought about it this week, the more that I realized that I think there are two different types of patience that we are asked to show just kind of in our everyday life. The first is one that I started calling this week the kind of patience that the practice makes perfect patience, and I think you know what that is. This is the kind of patience that it takes to learn how to play golf or how to play the piano or how to play any other sort of instrument or do anything like that. It's actually why I am a terrible golfer, because to be good at golf, you have to have this kind of patience. This is the kind of patience where you are willing to do the same thing over and over and over again, trusting that eventually it will lead to results. It's the kind of patience that you need to turn a puppy into a well-trained dog. But here's the thing about this kind of patience, and I think it's what makes it distinct. In the midst of this kind of patience, we maintain some sense of control. There is some, some, some bit of physical task, something that we can do to make progress towards whatever that goal may be. And it usually takes patience, don't get me wrong, right? It does, it takes patience. But we can chip away at the progress and it usually gets easier and easier and easier. If you want to learn the guitar, start watching YouTube videos and learn some basic chord progressions. You have to be patient with yourself, but there's something that you you can do. If you want your dog to stop peeing in the house, you can start taking them outside proactively until they finally figure out that they aren't supposed to go inside, they're supposed to go outside. It takes patience, but there's something that you can do about it. And there are tons of other examples, of course, but I think you get it. This practice makes perfect kind of patience. It allows us to maintain some sense of power, some sense of control, and some sense of of influence. The other type of patience is, I think, best summed up in the phrase that I said all the time as a kid. Are we there yet? You know this type of patience. It's the are we there yet kind of patience. It's that patience that we have to reach for in situations where we are powerless to change the circumstances. Of course, one example of that is when we as children are on a road trip and we turn to our parents because we decide that we're ready to be there and we ask the question, are we there yet? With some irritation in our voice, right? As an adult, it looks like sitting in traffic on 280 in rush hour, wishing that you had left earlier than you did, but here you are and you're absolutely powerless to change it. Or waiting in the security line at the airport, watching the time get closer and closer and closer to when you're supposed to board the plane. Or waiting in the checkout line as you watch the cashier work through all of the kinks of their first day of work. You know this kind of patience when we have no control to actually change the circumstance that we're in. And when we find ourselves in those moments, we can either get angry and start to feel our blood pressure rise, or we can be patient. And I think this is the kind of patience that James is talking about in this passage. It's the patience that we choose to have, that we choose to exhibit, even when we don't have any control. And he gives us a couple of examples of how this might look. The first is of a farmer having just planted his seeds, waiting for both the early and the late rains to come. I mean, talk about being completely powerless in a situation. 
And James here is writing of dry land farming in Palestine, which is before the invention of any sort of irrigation system. So the farmer here is truly dependent, not just on the early and the late rains coming, but of them coming at the right time and of them coming in the right amount so that his crop will be successful. Be patient like the farmer, James says. The second type, or the second example that James gives us is a little bit different. He talks about a prophet, someone who is willing to speak truth to power. And so notice here that the prophet is still powerless to an extent, but there is some sort of action involved on their part. Because the prophet has to be willing to speak the words that are given to them by God. And then they wait on the people that they are speaking to to hear them and to repent and to turn back to God. But really the only thing that the prophet can do is to faithfully say what it is that God has called them to say. And then they are forced to just simply be patient. And the third example that James gives us is Job, which I think is really interesting. And I had to kind of sit with that for for a little bit this this week. I feel like Job's story is fairly well known, even if you haven't read the book of Job. Job was a wealthy man. He was a faithful man who lost all of his possessions and all of his family. But even in the midst of one of the worst circumstances that any of us could ever imagine, Job remained patient. I don't know if that's the word that I would use for Job. I think I would use the word faithful, but James seems to call Job patient. And his story ends, Job's story ends, with him receiving back everything, all of his possessions, and a brand new family, nearly twofold to what it was before. And it seems that that is because he was patient and he was faithful. But Job's patience, just like the prophet, is not a passive patience. It's not a patience like the farmer waiting for the rains to come. It is an active patience. It's a patience that seems to be mixed with a sort of of endurance, though the prophet and Job are still both pretty powerless to change their actual situations. Because Job doesn't sit back like a farmer waiting for rain. And he also doesn't receive a word from God that he is able to then go share. If you were to open up the book of Job and just crack it open somewhere in the middle, chances are what you would see is Job petitioning to God. Job is full of these long monologues where he is advocating for his own innocence and yet at the same time standing up for God, never losing sight of the fact that he believes that God is just, even in the midst of a season that he can't fully wrap his his mind around. I was really intrigued with the fact that James included Job of all of the people in our scriptures to give us an example of what patience looks like. Does patience look like us finding ourselves in a season that we don't want to be in and we petition to God? I don't know. The more I thought about it, this is kind of where I landed with the patience of Job. I think that Job, that that his patience and his faithfulness and his endurance that he is able to show in that season of life, that it is rooted in this confidence, this unshakable confidence and belief that no matter what is going on in the world around him, no matter what is going on in his own life, Job is confident throughout the book that God is good, that God is faithful, and that God is just. And it is those truths for Job that allow him to be patient and to endure in the midst of a season that none of us could possibly imagine having to live through. Also, what I realize is that for James, two out of the three examples of what patience look like are active examples of patience. 
The prophet cries out to God, paying specific attention to the injustice and to the oppression of the world, knowing that they don't have much power to change it, but willing to do what they can and then be patient afterwards. And then, of course, the story of Job. I think both of those people exhibit a patience that is rooted in that confidence. That confidence that no matter what they are facing, that they trust and believe and know and will not let go of the fact that God is good and that God is faithful no matter what they are seeing happen around them. In a sense, it's an impatient patience, isn't it? A refusal to stop. And a belief that no matter what it is they are facing, they know that God is with them, and they know that God is good. And I think more than anything, maybe that is the sort of patience that God asks of us. One that is impatient. The patron saint of patience is Saint Monica, and I never heard her story until this week. She was born in 322, so a long time ago. She was raised in a Christian home in North Africa, and she was given in marriage to a pagan Roman man. And she lived with him and his mother-in-law, which sounds super duper fun, right? And neither one of them were Christians. And neither one of them had any interest in being Christians. In fact, they were constantly criticizing her for being a believer, And Monica's story is a story of endurance and a story of patience. For years, she prayed for them, for the conversion of her family members, but years went on and and nothing changed. And despite that, she continued to love them. She continued to to care for them. She continued to show them kindness. She continued to to be patient. She gave birth to three children, and her husband wouldn't allow for any of them to be to be baptized. I mean, it was like one thing after the other for for Monica. And one of her children, her oldest child, was the most difficult of all. He caused her so much pain and so much grief. And she tried to point him towards the faith, but he just relentlessly refused the direction of, of his mother. She finally discovered that he had joined this cult. It was like a crazy cult that was leading to this destructive lifestyle. And she went to the cult to try and pull him out of it. And he just continued to avoid her and to run from her. One night, this oldest child told his mother that he was going to go to the deck to say goodbye to a friend who was about to set sail for Rome. And instead, he set sail for Rome. And she found out about that. And what did she do? She set sail for Rome. And by the time she got to Rome, she found out that he was not in Rome, that he had gone to Milan. And then what did she do? She went to Milan. Throughout Monica's entire life, she was patient. She never gave up. And she waited well, praying constantly that her family would eventually see the hope and the truth in Christ. And after more than 15 years, just a year before his death, her husband and his mother, her mother-in-law, they finally converted to Christianity and they were baptized, both of them just about on their deathbed. And not long after that, that eldest son of hers, the one that she chased around the globe, the one that she was more patient with than anybody else, he did too. And his name is Augustine. Have you heard that name before? He's better known to us as St. Augustine of of Hippo, and he is credited as being one of the most influential theologians and church fathers in Christian history. I mean, his work is still read in seminaries all over the place. I had a whole class just on the story of, of Augustine. He has truly completely altered the trajectory of Christian thought and of Christian belief, still having written most of his work in the 300s, y'all. I mean, he had a massive impact on the Christian faith. And his story all started with patience. It all started with a mother being actively, very actively patient with her son. 
My hope this morning is that perhaps you begin to think of patience with a bigger mind than you did before. Understanding that that sometimes patience might look like a farmer waiting for the rain. That there may truly be nothing that we can do to change the circumstance. And yet be willing to wait even when there isn't a cloud in sight. But knowing that more times than not, our patience will look more like a prophet. Or look more like Job or perhaps a mother refusing to give up. That patience will usually require us to do something. And oftentimes, patience and endurance, the two of those things go hand in hand. And that for us, just like the prophet, and just like Job, and just like this this mother, that patience that God calls us to exhibit, it is rooted in the confidence that God is good and that God is faithful, no matter what it is that we are facing. Trusting that one day, as James writes in this passage, the Lord will return. That God will keep all of the promises that he has made to us to restore creation, to free and redeem God's people, to set right all that that is wrong, to heal all that is is broken. Really, this, this active patience that James is calling us towards, this patience that we see in the prophets, that we see in Job, that we see Monica exhibit, it rests on the simple belief that God is not finished with us. That God is not finished with our with our communities. That God isn't finished with our world yet. My hope as you reflect on this passage in James, hopefully for the rest of the week, looking for the areas in your life where God may be calling you to be just a little bit more patient, that you would be confident that no matter what it is you are facing in life, that God is good, that God is faithful, and that God is just. And more than anything else, friends, that God is with you. And it is because of that that we can be a patient people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in the gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.